Um, as Ron said, my name is John Nordley. I work at the computer science department at the University of North Dakota, among other places. Actually, my appointment is split between that uh, place called the Regional Weather Information Center and uh, the Computing Center, and I work with a lot of other, other departments, including space studies. Um, back in 1998, we started uh, the high altitude balloon program uh, in the space studies department, and I was <coughs> helping out with that. And we were flying. We did a lot of flights of helium balloons and, and different things like that. But today, what I'm here to talk to you about is a kind of a different concept that we've started to explore just in the last year or so, which is the use of uh, solar-powered hot air balloons. So, first, some background here. What is a solar balloon? Well, it's a balloon that uses hot air for lift. It doesn't use any lighter than air lift gases. No helium, no hydrogen, no methane, no anything like that. It's just plain old hot air. Been doing this since the you know, Montgolfier brothers way back when. Um, but the difference is, whereas most hot air balloons use some type of an energy source, such as like a, a burner, you know, propane or different things like that to heat the gas within <coughs> the envelope, solar balloons just use the heat of the sun to heat the envelope itself, and then that envelope will heat all the air that it's in contact with, and some of that air will be on the inside of the envelope and be trapped and not able to escape, and it will therefore build up higher and higher temperature until it reaches equilibrium um, with the, um, uh, the energy transfer, and that uh, lower density then generates the lift of the balloon. So here's an example of one of our solar balloons that we flew. This one was actually uh, back in December of uh, 2013, and this is what we call a uh, tetrahedral balloon or a tetrune. You've probably heard of uh, that um, concept before. Basically, it's sort of similar to this one, although if you kind of look at this one, eh, it's pretty ugly. It's not, you know, really super close to tetrahedral. Maybe if you're Gumby or something like that, it would be closer. But uh, the idea is that a tetrahedral shape it has a greater surface area than a spherical balloon for one thing, and for another thing, they're like really, really easy to build out of rectangular sheets of plastic. Um, this particular flight, this balloon is about five meters in diameter, about 16 feet, and it is carrying a uh, radar reflector here uh, on the bottom. So some of the advantages of using solar balloons uh, for high altitude ballooning. <clears throat> The biggest one probably for many uh, organizations is it's really, really cheap, all right? Now, the balloons that we use, again, if we're you know, shooting for like a, what, a 1,200, 1,500 gram balloon, something like that, what the, the envelope itself is, what, maybe $100, $120, something like that, you're probably gonna put a couple hundred dollars worth of helium in it. Um, the balloon that I just showed you before here, this guy, guess how much this costs to build? Anybody? About $8 worth of stuff went into this. So it's uh, inexpensive, basically, um, is, uh, is an understatement. Uh, the, the envelope material, basically, we're using plastic sheet. This is obviously a zero pressure balloon. Um, this particular model that I have here, I kind of cheated and sealed up the bottom. I also cheated and put helium in it so it would float. But we usually have the nozzle end of this open so that it will uh, vent to the atmosphere naturally as it's going up and the gas is expanding inside. <clears throat> uh, we need some tape to seal the edges of the bag together. Uh, in the case of this balloon, we just used plain old regular masking tape from the hardware store. Um, you don't see any of it on the outside because the last step that we did when putting the balloon together was turn the entire thing inside out so all the tape seams are on the inside. Gives you a little bit uh, more area to co collect the sun and also it looks kind of cooler. And then of course you need some lift gas and lift gas when you're using air is relatively easy to come by. All you need is a fan, hair dryer, something like that to basically pump the uh, envelope full of air and then you need sunlight to warm it. So, in terms of safety, this is probably one of the safest technologies that you could use to do, um, you know, balloon work with, at least in my humble opinion. Um, you're not dealing with any pressurized gas, so you don't have to have any plumbing to handle that. You don't have to handle tanks. Um, you're not using anything flammable, so you don't need to worry about that. It's pretty, pretty simple, pretty uh, low-tech, uh, low-risk stuff. Um, there's also the issue of reusability. If you're doing tethered flights with these things, it's pretty easy just to crank it down, push all the air out of it, stuff it back in the box, and you're good to go for the next time. You're not throwing away that envelope 
every single flight. Uh, one of the things that we are considering is maybe reuse, reusing the envelopes uh, with, uh, for free flights um, if there's a way to hopefully capture the envelope and keep it with the payload during descent. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later um, when we're talking about uh, termination of the flight. Some disadvantage of, uh, of, these, of this technology. It doesn't produce as much lift as a lighter than air gas, okay? You're just never really gonna get around that. Um, because you have a lower lift per cubic foot of the gas that you're using, you have to use a larger envelope to lift the same size payload. Um, the ascent rate is lower. The, uh, per, the flight that I showed you there before, um, we had about a three or four foot per second ascent rate, which is pretty pokey when you, you know, look at some other, like a helium balloon, especially if you overfill it. Uh, some other groups that have done these said that they have a lower maximum altitude. We did not get to track ours to the maximum altitude for our test flight because we didn't actually have any active electronics on board. We were just using that passive radar reflector and uh, our radar system on the roof here uh, lost track of it when it got about 100 kilometers out. So we need to do a little bit more work to characterize that. Um, you obviously need a nice clear sky with bright sun since that's your energy source. Of course, that kind of takes care of the part of not launching into clouds, you know, under part, uh, part 101, because if you don't have sun, this thing's not going to fly. So the weather it, uh, dependencies are a little bit more strict. Um, and also you have the time and effort to actually build the envelope versus buying it. Uh, the envelope I showed you before, uh, Jeremy Straub, who's back in the, the back of the auditorium here, and I built that one, I think in about two hours. Isn't that, isn't that what it took us? So. Uh, you know, it's, it's non-trivial in terms of the amount of time and effort to build one. It's not, not, you know, necessarily rocket science. It's just cutting things and taping things up, but it does take some time. <clears throat> the history of solar ballooning. There are many other groups that build and fly these things. There's a solar balloon group on Yahoo groups, and there's also a lot of other um, groups out there. There's one in France that does a lot of these. Um, there's some folks out in Colorado that fly them, different things like that. So this has been around for a while. They use it for a variety of applications. Uh, some people are using uh, these to loft cameras to do mapping or imaging, different things like that, remote sensing. Um, obviously, atmospheric sciences, you can loft in situ payloads to do um, measurements, different things like that. And of course, we have the toys and recreation. Everybody's probably seen the you know, solar UFO balloon that you can buy for uh, like five bucks or something like that, which is basically nothing more than this. It's just a big bag that you put air into. So, the first, uh, we've done a couple flights here at UND at, um, for solar balloons. The first one was back in July 21st of 2013. That was our first proof of concept flight. That's one I actually did on my own because I had never seen this technology actually work before. And before <clears throat> I trotted this out to some of my colleagues and stuff like that, I didn't really want to look like an idiot and what, you know, Nordly, what are you up to? You can garbage bag and a hair dryer? Okay, you know, I think you need to take some vacation or something. But um, so I built. Uh, our first one of these, uh, which is about 10 foot in diameter, it was made out of 16 black plastic trash bags, 33 gallon, 0.7 mil uh, thickness. That was the thinnest trash bags I could find in town at the time, and one roll of masking tape. Um, I flew this without any payload or tracking, and here's a picture of it uh, inflated out in the parking lot here. My actual original concept, or my uh, intent with this, was to take this out, inflate it, and then I had, you know, a little cup and some bird shot, and I was going to measure how much lift they had and be all scientific, you know, and write everything down in a notebook. And, of course, as soon as I got this thing inflated, the wind started to come up. And it totally screwed up any measurements I was going to do. So I was just, uh, finally got disgusted and cut the thing loose to see if it actually blew away. And it did, so everything was fine and dandy. You'll notice here it is not lifting the 20-pound dumbbell that it is attached to. So it doesn't have quite that much uh, lift, right? Um, the second one we did after we knew that the, after I knew this technology would actually work was on December 9th of 2013. Um, this was a larger balloon that we built. Jeremy and I built uh, the 16 foot in diameter one that was made out of 36 uh, black trash black plastic trash bags. Um, these ones are 0.5 mil uh, thickness. That's actually I think one of these. The the, thin, the thickness of the material is obviously significant because you know it has to do with how much weight the thing uh, the envelope actually uh, entails. Um, and this one only carried for a payload the uh, passive radar reflector, which was just made out of some foam core board and aluminum foil. And that uh, radar reflector weighed approximately 17.1 ounces. So 
basically that was a, a test for the, capacity, the lifting capacity. Here's a picture of us filling that. It was about 10 degrees below zero Fahrenheit on the day when we flew this, um, which just kind of goes to show that we're nuts here in North Dakota. But uh, one of the nice things about this day was basically this is as close as you're getting uh, for, in terms of the sun being low. This was about 11 o'clock in the morning when we were doing this filling. So this was kind of like the best case of the worst case in terms of the amount of available solar energy because you have sun angle that's very low, um, but we have a cl perfect uh, clear uh, day, clear blue sky, stuff like that. So I'm filling this up here with a hairdryer. That's Dr. Marsh uh, hanging on there, making sure it doesn't get away. And when we flew this thing, we had uh, Chris Tyson of the Atmospheric Sciences Department track it with the uh, dual uh, pole Doppler radar uh, that we have on the roof of this building. And here is basically the data points that he got from that. We have the altitude of the balloon here, and then this is the range, downrange that the uh, balloon was going. And we see that we got up to about just shy, at least the last uh, reading that we took here was about 12 kilometers in height, or about 36,000 feet, I believe. And the thing was still going up in a fairly linear fashion. So, you know, uh, not bad for basically a bunch of garbage bags uh, lofting a one pound payload. And the thing, actually, we did get a call from somebody who found it. Uh, Jeremy put uh, labels on the radar reflectors, so if anybody found this, and you can disregard this blue line, this is just the driving directions to get there, but <laughs> it didn't follow the roads nicely like, you know, we hope that our balloons will. Uh, we actually got a call from a fellow out in Aurora, Minnesota, which is out by Hibbing uh, in the Arrowhead region there, uh, who found our balloon. So it's, it went about 230 miles downrange before it landed. And of course it landed, basically there was no flight termination system other than sun went down, balloon gets cold, down it comes. So. What makes for a good solar balloon? If we're gonna still you know, continue on and we think that this is a viable technology, especially for like STEM outreach and things like that, schools that might have a lower budget or be a little you know, worried about working with <coughs> different high pressure gases and stuff like that. So what, what makes the best uh, materials for making one of these out? Well, obviously you want something that's going to absorb sunlight, right? Um, it also has to be sufficiently strong so that it can contain that buoyant gas without tearing so that it can't be overly sensitive so that when you're handling it, laying it out, stuff like that, you know, won't uh, easily rip. Um, it should be low weight, because obviously every ounce of weight that is in the envelope is one more ounce that is unavailable to put into your payload. And let's see, it should be easily available materials, something that uh, people could uh, come across not too uh, difficult. And it should be low cost. So. What have others used? Well, the black plastic trash bag is kind of one of the classic things for this. A lot of people have built these based upon uh, that type of material. Others have also used uh, high density polyethylene sheeting, which is uh, more commonly known as like painter's drop cloth, things like that. That tends to come in a thinner uh, gauge than uh, the, the trash bags. Um, they've used it, interestingly enough, both in its original clear configuration, which you figure how can it absorb any sunlight if it's clear, um, and then some other groups have always, already also used the sheeting and then added their own pigment to darken the envelope so that it'll be a better solar uh, collector. Um, they've used a number of different things to do that. Um, they report that there's pretty good uh, uh, performance from a black paint pigment, which is based on iron oxide. Um, other groups have also used like charcoal, bone black, tempera paint pigment, different things like that um, to, uh, as a solar uh, pigment. So the experiment that we did here, how effective is the solar heating? We want to uh, use some different uh, things that are locally available. So we picked our uh, black trash bags, of course, because that was easy enough. And then we uh, also got a roll of painter's plastic. Um, we use that both uh, in an untreated state. And then I couldn't get my hands on any of that uh, iron oxide paint pigment. But uh, basically, <clears throat> we uh, came across uh, some printer toner powder, which seemed to be a good, you know, uh, substitute for that. Here's our very highly um, sophisticated test cell that was built by our chairman of uh, computer science. It's basically made it out of foam rubber here. It's got three different compartments. Um, we have three thermometers there in the top to measure the temperature inside of each one of these. I have uh, three different um, samples of material here. We've got the um, the black uh, trash bag here, the clear painter's drop cloth here, and then the one that has the toner smeared upon it. 
Basically, I propped this up here um, in the windows uh, of one of the uh, offices. Um, and then I've also got a light shield here to keep the sunlight from striking the thermometers directly. Measure both the heating and the cooling. Um, ideally, we would have had this outside. However, it was a windy day. The wind was you know, cooling off the, uh, the test cells. It was also starting to make the uh, material flutter and loosening the tape. So that's why I decided to do it on the inside. Um, obviously, you're going to get some UV filtering and different things like that. The windows are tinted. But the important thing is the relative ability to collect solar thing, not necessarily the absolute. So we figured it was still a good test. And then we also did uh, some cooling tests to see how quickly these things cooled down. So here's basically the money shot. This is our three temperatures here. We have our temperature scale on the left and then the elapsed time of the experiment on the right. I ran the experiment out until we reached equilibrium for all three of our temperatures. Um, the blue here is the clear plastic painter's uh, cloth. The red is the uh, clear plastic plus the toner. And then the green is the garbage bag. Not too surprisingly, the green absorbed the, um, the heat the fastest and also uh, um, basically, <clears throat> excuse me, reach the highest equilibrium temperature. The surprising thing was the clear actually performed pretty well too. In fact, it reached the same equilibrium temperature as the uh, drop cloth that had just the toner powder on it. And then we did a, a cooling um, test as well. This one is actually, they start out at a different temperature um, here between the clear and everything else. And this was actually before I put the light shield on the thing. I figured, well, when I first ran it, it's just like the clear was just skyrocketing. I thought the thermometer was going to explode. I'm just like, what is going on here? Well, what was happening was the sun was going through the plastic and heating the thermometer directly. So I didn't repeat this cooling experiment. Um, didn't have time that particular day to do that. But as you see, even though this one started at a higher temperature, everything pretty much cools off at approximately the same rate. So. Our results, our black plastic garbage bag material heated the fastest and it reached the highest uh, equilibrium temperature. Um, the pr uh, painter's plastic with toner less quickly and reached a lower steady state temperature. And then our untreated painter's plastic heated its lowest of all, but it actually hit the steady state temperature equal to the toner. Uh, some additional considerations when we're looking at materials, black plastic garbage bags, yeah, they're cheap, they're easy, e easily available. Um, it takes more effort, however, to construct the envelope. You have to cut them apart to turn them into sheets before you tape them back together again to make bigger sheets and then put them into an envelope. Uh, groups have said the plastic is mechanically weaker than the painter's plastic, even though it is thicker. Uh, I do know that it's pretty easy to put your finger through uh, the 0.5 mil bags. You have to be a little bit careful while you're handling them, different things like that. If you get tape on them accidentally in the wrong place, you cannot pull the tape off. It tears the, the plastic, so you just have to put more tape on. However, it is a very efficient solar collector, and it should produce higher lift, hopefully due to the higher temperature air, although that will be somewhat offset by the higher weight. The painter's plastic, again, cheap and easily available. Lower efficiency um, in terms of both the treated and the untreated. We'll have to do more uh, experiments on the untreated to see if those uh, results are real. And then there is, of course, the added mess and hassle of adding a pigment after the fact if you're going to treat uh, the inside of the balloon with that. However, they are simpler to assemble. You can get it in a roll 12 feet across and to cut and tape or you know, heat seal or do something like that, you'd be doing less of that than with the uh, garbage bags. So all said and done, we're probably going to stick with our garbage bags for the moment, although we are going to do some more uh, experiments to see um, you know, if uh, that uh, basically uh, pans out. And future work, we want to construct some identical envelopes from each material, basically do some real world lift testing. So the same size balloons on the same day, all out in the same conditions, you know, put a scale on each one to see how much lift it generates, stuff like that. Make sure that our clear plastic thing is not actually, uh, you know, that wasn't actually the test cell just heating up from the sun. That was actually the balloon material. That is a possible uh, source of error in that experiment. So th these are just the first baby steps of actually um, doing this. I'd also like to find a supplier of bulk plastic um, garbage bag material in 0.5 thick, uh, thickness um, that comes on a nice big long roll so we don't have to buy all these stupid little bags and spend forever cutting them up. And then we need to do some free flights to characterize the flight capabilities of the thing in terms of how big a balloon you need to lift a given size payload, what's the maximum altitude you're actually going to hit with these things, ascent rate, different things like that. Better characterize um, the ability of these things to fly. Oops. 
And again, uh, at the last thing here, the flight termination, again, it's a zero pressure envelope. It's a little bit more work. It's not just going to automatically pop like these things do. Um, one of the uh, uh, ways you can do this is to basically have the balloon itself and you have a way to make maybe some tape or something like that that you put up on top of it to make that part heavier than the nozzle. And then you have a regular cutaway mechanism that just releases the balloon. Now when the balloon's heavier on top and her nozzle's open, it should um, rotate you know, basically 180 80 degrees um, and go to a stable configuration like this with the most weight on the bottom with the nozzle up. That'll release all the hot air and down it'll come. Um, we also thought of basically having a second tether line, which is, does not have a cut down going from your payload up to the top of the balloon. When your cut down triggers in that case, the envelope still turns over, but it stays attached to the balloon. All right, excuse me, it stays attached to the uh, payload. And so the gas should vent, and then the thing should end up being this gigantic streamer attached to your payload, which will help slow it down on the descent. Um, if it isn't damaged too badly, maybe you can reuse the envelope, tape it up or something like that, not have to construct a new one. At the very least, you can at least collect it and dispose of it properly rather than having it become another piece of windblown trash. So, questions? Yes? No, what trajectory predictions did you do for your um, trash bag balloon and what interactions did you have with the FAA prior? Um, since these were sub four pounds, um, they were exempt flights. And all we did was basically call our supervisor of flight in this case. I know that space studies uh, is a little more um, outgoing. They, they talk to the FAA more. We've had different ex experience with the FAA. Sometimes we'll call them and they say, you guys are exempt, don't bother us, you know, don't call us with these things. And it, it'll depend on who you get on the other, other end of the line. Um, one of the nice things about these things is that they're really, really visible. Because on a bright, clear blue day, you know, you have this dark, black, ominous looking thing that's flying around in a clear blue sky. Um, the, the visibility is pretty good. Did you do any predictions, trajectory predictions? We didn't. Um, we pr pretty much everything here flies to the east. Uh, I, I, uh, Chris Tyson actually looked at some of the upper air uh, um, wind uh, uh, soundings because he had to design the, the scan pro profile uh, for the radar. So he did some basic predictions, and uh, you know we've used ball track and different things like that to do. But we didn't really know what the ascent rate of this thing was going to be. So it was just kind of like, well, we know it's going to go to the east, but how fast and how far? Uh, I don't know. You know, that's why we were doing that flight, pretty much to try to figure that out. Okay, I believe you're next. Uh, you were talking about having a light payload and then using the balloon as a streamer. Would you also need a parachute, or would that be enough to not? have the weight of the parachute? That's a good question. It depends on how heavy our, our actual payload would be. Um, how to characterize that without actually breaking a payload or having it come down really fast. It's, um, we, were, we were discussing both having that and having like maybe an auxiliary drogue chute on the thing to give it a little bit more drag to make sure that it doesn't come down too quickly and break things. Yeah. I'm not sure how much you um, looked at this, um, and I'm not sure if I caught it or not, but it seems like there are at least two mechanisms here for heating the air. One would be the actual balloon itself, the actual envelope mm -hmm. getting warm and causing the gas inside to warm. But then the other one would be kind of a greenhouse effect where the, um, the energy coming in gets converted into infrared and that it doesn't go out. Yep. So it seems like there are at least two mechanisms there for heating the air inside. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that or comments on that. Uh, it, it, it is an interesting question. Actually, Dr. Reamer, one of our atmospheric sciences uh, professors who heard about this idea, he said this would be a great thing for my thermodynamics class to try to model. Um, I know that there are some uh, models that exist for, you know, the, the radiative heat transfer and different things like that. Um, I think that even on Wikipedia there might be one. Um, we haven't really studied it in depth. This was kind of just like a will it work at all uh, type test. And the other thing is that there seems possibly there's an optimal size because um, if, if it's too big, then your surface to volume ratio is, is if, it's, if the mechanism is heating the envelope, you know, the material, mm -hmm. and that gets warm, but then it's up the gas inside, there could be a 
kind of popped Yep, yep. I mean, obviously your, your surface area is going up as the square, but your volume is going up as the cube of your radius. And yeah, I mean, you, you could definitely overdo it. Because it's not just like a bigger balloon automatically means more lift. So that, that would be a good be a great size for yeah. students to look into. Thanks. I, I think that's a good idea. Have you looked at all into heat sealing your seams or you know the survivability of your tape seams during extended low temperature flight? Uh, we have not. I mean, we haven't looked at the uh, the survivability, but the heat sealing. I know that there are other groups who do that. There's a number of different ways of doing that. I actually got a plastic welding kit and and some. Uh, uh, supplies to try that with the uh, painter's plastic because I know a lot of groups that use a painter's plastic do that um, since it's a lot lighter than adding all this tape which doesn't you know, <coughs> give you anything in terms of lift but that's another thing we need to look at uh, in the future is easier ways to constructing the envelope. James? Have you ever heard of anybody who, who mixes and matches a bit as in they take something like this and they fill it part way with helium and then the rest of the way with here. That, that's a good point. We were actually discussing that and one of the flights that uh, we're looking at hopefully doing with a setup like this next week is uh, a test uh, flight for CubeSat and we said if we don't have enough lift on a particular day in terms of the sun we can always make it a hybrid lift system. We can shoot some helium in there. It doesn't have to be all helium um, but to, to give it a, a little additional lift and then of course the heating of the helium will increase its efficiency as a lift gas as well. Um, <coughs> One of the drawbacks to that in terms of our characterization flights is, okay, you have this thing that's got some helium and some air and the sun and stuff, and it goes up this high. Well, what does that mean? You know, was that all solar heating or was it, you know, the, the re repeatability becomes uh, a concern. But, uh, but yeah, we're, we're definitely not averse to using um, lift gases within one of these envelopes, either as a mix with helium, probably not hydrogen, but, or, you know, like just a, the pure gas like I have here. You can just treat it as a regular, uh, a regular uh, zero pressure envelope. Anybody else have? Yes. I'm just thinking a little bit more about the two, the clear one versus the, the black one. You know, maybe the clear one is more of a greenhouse mm -hmm. effect, and then the black one is more of a thermal, thermally heating the envelope effect. Some groups have made these like half black and half clear. Oh, okay. So you know the sunlight will shine through and only heat the one one surface and, and different things like that. And that would be an interesting thing to try. Um, and you know, characterize versus the other things. One more question I think is all we have time for. When it landed, did, you, did it come back intact with that 230 mile uh, adventure that it had? Did it come back intact or, or did it have scratches or did the tape come off and stuff like that? Unfortunately, we didn't recover the uh, thing. We only just got a call from the fellow who found it and uh, there were some communications issues. So. Uh, we never actually went out and got the thing. I think he just found it, gave us a call, and then he ended up just throwing it away. So unfortunately, we, we don't know. Thank you.